Welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Harding. I'm the editor and founder of uh, Tortoise. Um, I started out as a reporter at the Financial Times and to give you a sense of the pecking order uh, in the FT newsroom, there were serious economists, proper economists, economists, and then all the rest of us, right? And I, that means, just to give you fair warning before we start, um, we weren't really on the pecking order. <laughs> we were reporters. And so you're unfortunately in the hands of a reporter this evening, but the great news is that we've got three of what the FT would call serious economists. That is the top rank of economists. Uh, Linda Yu, many of you uh, will know, of course, uh, from our broadcasting for the BBC, um, uh, but she's a, a, an economist uh, at, uh, uh, at, at Oxford. Stephen King, um, who has been the um, HSBC's chief global economist uh, uh, for years and years. And actually, I think when I was the business editor of the uh, Times, Stephen, I spent most of my time ripping off the notes that you'd sent around the world. Uh, and use those as my, uh, uh, as, uh, as my system. And then, uh, and James Smith, who's the research director at the Mighty Resolution Foundation, um, which if you're unfortunate enough to be working in the Tortoise newsroom, will know is the think tank that I most regularly quote. But obviously, James, I'm not decent or generous enough to say that I'm actually just uh, using your ideas, but trying to pretend that they're my own. So we've got in Linda and in Stephen and in James, the, you know, a brilliant trio of people to try and understand where the economy is going. And so I suppose that what we're trying to do in the next hour is get, first of all, a sense of what the UK economy and in the context of the global economy faces, the extent to which lockdown furlough schemes have, if you like, shielded us from what's coming. And then the extent to which the Chancellor's statement, Rishi Sunak's statement yesterday, meaningfully addresses the challenges to come. Um, if, you've, if you've ever been to a thinking before, you'll know it's like an open news meeting, which means we want to hear everyone's point of view. Um, everyone has direct personal experience of this, and some of you, heaven knows, might be serious economists uh, too. But whether you're like me or a serious economist, please do weigh in. Do so in the chat. My colleague, uh, Liz Mosley, uh, as you can see, is uh, managing the chat. She's outed me as a Resolution Foundation super fan. Pretty small group, I think, but we're ardent, James, I should tell you. Um, and um, so weigh in in the chat or just put your hand up and I'll, I'll bring you in. Um, but Stephen, can we, would, would you start us off? I would love to get a sort of sense from you of, of what you think's coming. Well, it's not good news, <clears throat> although first of all, I would say that I think, James, you've lulled us into a full sense of security by being far too modest about your own abilities. It makes me feel very, very nervous indeed. <laughs> um, but first things first, what is Rishi Sunak been trying to do over the last um, few months? What have every finance minister around the world been trying to do? The answer really is to build a bridge a bridge that takes us from a pre-virus world to eventually a post-virus world. And the reason why you want to do that is because the lockdowns associated with health protocols in themselves are incredibly destructive eco economically. Um, and the danger of the lockdowns, of course, is that you have mass bankruptcies, you have mass unemployment, you have all the things that you would associate with maybe the Great Depression of the 1930s or possibly even worse than that. So. The reason for the, the sort of bailouts, whether it's furlough schemes or help for businesses or whatever, is really to try to build a bridge to prevent business from going bust, to prevent mass unemployment, and to eventually hope that when COVID-19 is in retreat, either because the virus has died out or because we have a vaccine or because antiviral drugs are more successful, to hope that by that stage, you can kind of bring the economy out of hibernation and you can go back to a certain level of business as usual. That's the hope. Um, the problem, of course, for economists, um, as much as we might possibly know, is that we really can't forecast the epidemiology of the virus itself. Mm -hmm. There's massive uncertainty. And that, of course, equally means there's massive uncertainty if you're a finance minister, because you just don't know uh, when a normal level of revenues is going to return. So what we had earlier in the year from Sunak, I think, was something that was, in my view, pretty impressive, an attempt to ensure that much of this hibernation process could happen. What we had yesterday, I would say, 
is just slightly more headline grabbing. You know, a meal yeah. for two at Wagga Manor on a Monday evening or something sounds impressive, but it's not going to do an awful lot for the economy. Um, certainly, there's help for the young in terms of apprenticeships and so on, which I think is welcome. Uh, but what is the, the biggest uncertainty really is what happens um, when furlough schemes themselves begin to unwind over the next three or four months. If at the same time, businesses have not really gone back to what you might describe as normality. Steve, Steve um, we, can, can, but before, so I'd like to come to the Sunak statement and, if you like, the remedies. But I'd just like to, to hear a bit more from you on what you think the economic outlook is. And, and the reason, I suppose, is that I was quite surprised last week by Andy Haldane at the Bank of England. Yes. Who, who gave you quite a lot of reason, although the speech was obviously sort of you know, more textured than perhaps the headline. But the, the speech gave you confidence in the idea of a, a big bounce back in demand and yep. therefore some reason to expect, expect a V-shaped recovery, while you had a host of other people say, no, we're going to see unemployment ratchet up quite quickly, month by month, north of 4 million people. And that is going to have a long-term effect, meaning a big drag on demand, confidence, business investment. And so we're going to have a very, very long, slow process of getting back to where we were pre-COVID. And the answer here, where, I think, where you, where you sit on that. Yeah. So the answer, I think, first of all, is that the V that Andy Haldane is describing is a V that most people kind of agree with, which is that the third quarter may be better than the second quarter. But that's not telling you very much what's ha happening thereafter. Um, it's also important to stress that his V is partly based on things like Google mobility data, which is telling you that... Funnily enough, there's been more people going to the hairdressers over the last week or so than was the case over the last three months, obviously. Mm. Um, so when lockdowns come to an end, yes, of course, the economy rebounds. But the thing that economists mostly worry about is the issue of what we call scarring, uh, which is the sense that there are permanent losses associated with the lockdown that no matter how much fiscal policy and, and monetary policy support you offer, you can't do much about and that scarring is partly an issue about internal versus external lockdowns. So even if the UK rebounds, even if Europe rebounds, the rest of the world is frankly still in considerable trouble, whether it's the Americas, whether it's India, whether it's Pakistan, there are a whole bunch of countries that are facing considerable difficulty. We're not gonna suddenly reopen our economic linkages with them overnight. That's your first constraint. Mm. The second constraint is that a lot of investment that would have happened inevitably is gonna be postponed or canceled. That's gonna eat yeah. away at growth, it's going to eat away at the capital stock, it's going to eat away at productivity growth probably over the next few years. Um, thirdly, I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that whatever's happening in Britain uh, is in danger of being eclipsed by some really big global power gains which are potentially going in the wrong direction. So when we think about America's decision to pull out of funding of the World Health Organization, and um, this is partly a story about Sino-US relations in the sense yeah. that somehow the WHO is, is working on behalf of China rather than the US. And so we're also likely to emerge, I think, with a much more toxic relationship at the very top of the table, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And if that's also true, uh, then the world that the UK comes back into as it comes out of its own hibernation is going to be that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a problem for, for, for the Chancellor in one sense, because if the, the level of activity into the future is permanently lower, Mm -hmm. as seems quite likely, that in turn means that he's going to be permanently facing a shortfall in terms of tax revenues. Yeah. But although it's the right thing to do currently, to borrow a lot, to provide support, to al allow this kind of hibernation to take place, there's a danger that at some point in the future, you know, four, five, six years down the road, uh, UK government let the debt levels are rising to the kinds of levels you only associate with wartime, whether it's the Napoleonic Wars, whether it's the First World War, whether it's the Second World War. Mm. And at that point, people are going to start saying, well, who's paying for this? Mm -hmm. Now, you could, in one sense, fiddle the financial system and keep interest rates very low and do it that way, which you could say is rather similar to what Japan has experienced over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. You could do it via inflation, by inflating your way out of the problem, which gets rid of government debt. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge penalty for savers, particularly retiring poor cash savers, who would lose out significantly. But I think the most likely thing we're going to end up with, frankly, is higher taxes. Um, mm -hmm. And the lesson there is actually from the Napoleonic Wars, where William Pitt the Younger introduced income tax for the first time in 1799. And it's been with us more or less ever since. Um, it won't be income tax necessarily, but I think that there'll be a, a lot of discussion about future taxes, the kinds of taxes that could be raised, 
Because in effect, what we are doing in this country and elsewhere is borrowing from our own futures, which I think is the right thing to do. But if the futures themselves are worse off as a result of this, then mm -hmm. someone eventually has to pick up a bill for it. S Stephen, thank you. Uh, I, I think the right word is thank you. But actually, when I pot up what you just said, and it's that mix of, all right, so you have scarring of the economy, high unemployment, depressed demand, um, constraints on business investment, a global picture in which the US China, the, the Chinese US um, tensions presumably also impact global demand and, and prospects for trade and government debt quietly ratcheting up in the background. All, all of that spells to me a very, very difficult you know, a few years ahead. I, I don't know, Linda, let me come to you. I, I don't know why I was sort of throwing this at you, but, but the picture that, the, I mean, the, the picture that Stephen paints is, is even with all the world of uncertainty we've got, you know, hard to argue with. Is it possible to put any kind of uh, f framework or any scale on, on the length of the recession we see, on the, the numbers of people that are unemployed, how, how do you try to give a meaningful forecast for the next, I would say, let's say six to 18 months? James, it's very difficult to put a number um, on it because I think um, we've had a huge range of forecasts from the Bank of England, the OECD, the IMF, and you might notice that every time they give an update, the numbers change quite a bit. A um, and. And that's because um, it is one of the most uncertain things um, to forecast because essentially a pandemic um, of this scale we haven't seen in probably a hundred years. And so, um, you know, it's when forecasters look at this, they tend to say things like a trend is a trend until it bends. It's bent. Mm -hmm. And this is why um, when we look at what shape the recovery um, might be, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a very broad range of estimates. So for instance, the OECD expects that um, should we have a second wave of COVID, that unemployment will be around 5 million. Um, and just as a reminder of the scale of that, that's 15% unemployment rate. And in the 1980s and 1990s recessions, um, unemployment was about 3 million, and now it's exceptionally painful. And that's sort of one, one, uh, one indicator of, I think, uh, where it could be. But I think what all the forecasts probably share in common is there is, a, there is an assumption that government can do something to stabilize uh, the recovery and potentially to help it. Um, but what government can't do um, through fiscal policy is to really, you know, work out what's going to happen with COVID, the vaccine, the second wave, multiple waves. And so the immediate outlook um, is something like you've had pent up demand in the second, uh, in this period, in the last, um, from March until June, that's the second quarter. Mm -hmm. So as people um, come emerge from lockdown, um, they start getting their haircuts, they start doing things again. Um, the indications from other countries so that you get this you get this rebound effect mm -hmm. in this quarter which is July through September um, but then mm -hmm. it could weigh it could actually vary quite a lot from there and probably just one thing to to add is um, when we talk about percentages um, they can look pretty dramatic um, mm -hmm. you know April GDP um, fell uh, between March and April GDP national output was a quarter um, smaller than it was in February, but you also have to think about the level. So even if we have a, a strong rebound, almost all the forecasts agree, it will still take quite a long time, probably well into next year, before mm. the level of income that we're currently at is mm. reached. Um, yeah. So that just gives you a sense of the scale of the damage. L Linda, can you, can, you, can you help us through one thing, which is the, the economics of unemployment. So I want to ask James in a minute about who gets hit. If, when unemployment rises, right? But what I don't understand, or one of the things I, I can't forecast is when unemployment rises, let's say it does rise to 4.5, 5 million people, mm. which as you say, is something that, you know, we actually have never experienced in our, in our lifetimes. If it rises to that, 
five minutes. What, what happens then, for example, defaults on mortgages? What happens to mm. spending? What happens to tax incomes and, you know, the sort of things like sterling? It, are, are people beginning to try and model what the knock-on impacts of mass unemployment will be for the mm. macroeconomic picture? Uh, the answer is yes, that is absolutely the most important factor in this kind of uh, shock. So if you have um, unemployment rising to um, you know, those kinds of very worrying numbers, but even if it doesn't rise to those numbers and it rises, say it doubles from the unemployment rate, which we currently have, that would still be quite a lot. So what you tend to see there is this is how a short term shock ends up inflicting damage on the potential of the economy to grow. So translated into uh, English, <laughs> that means that you have millions of people who are not actively contributing to um, the economy because they're unemployed. Mm -hmm. Their skills could become obsolete. They could become discouraged. They could drop out of the labor force. And once that happens, you've lost both the number of workers and the skills of those workers. Both of those things are critical to um, our growth potential, our productive capability. Yeah. Those are people are also taxpayers. Um, and if you have a drop in uh, taxpayers, consumers, that has a knock on effect on demand. So firms would say, well, actually, there's not that much demand for what I'm producing. I'm going to produce less. So now the firms also produce less. So you could end up with this knock on effect. And that, of course, then affects tax revenues and that affects yeah. how much the government can spend. Um, yeah. So all of those things suggest the most important thing um, to try and just get a handle on and make sure that the shock doesn't impose, doesn't cause permanent damage is about keeping people employed, self-employed, yeah. attached to um, the workforce. And then everything else, as you say, kind of sterling stock markets, that all comes on the back of um, what's expected to be the future earnings of uh, companies in this country, the exporters of this country, the demand for imports from this country. So there's yeah. quite a lot of uh, potential damage from high unemployment. Well, all right, Lenore, I'm, I'm going to double back with you and with Stephen and, and, and in time with James on what the Chancellor, or shall I say the, the waiter, Rishi Sunak has done. And I see that there's lots of commentary in the chat about meal deals and all the rest of it. But, but I do still think that it's really important before we get into what the Chancellor's doing to just get this macroeconomic sense of what's, what's coming. And so, James, w w you know, the Resolution Foundation, the re one of the reasons why I'm such an admirer of it is it has a lens, you know, this lens on, you know, middle and lower income families and how economic policy will hit them. Can you just pick up where Linda left off in terms of what do you expect that kind of mass unemployment to do in terms of who gets hit hardest and where? Can I have a quick word on, on V-shaped recoveries? Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Sure. That. So, v, so the, the, U, bathtub, the, the, version, yes. Well, well, the big thing with this is um, basically all our charts broke. So um, we had such a massive hit to the economy in the second quarter. Uh, basically all our lines just fill up our charts and, and things happen that we just never thought were possible or in the distribution of outcomes that we even considered. And um, what's going to happen as we go forward as the economy um, uh, gradually comes back to life, as, as Stephen was putting it, is our charts are going to break again in the opposite direction. Everyone's going to get very excited because things are going to start growing at faster rates than we've ever seen before. But the problem is this is not telling you anything. This is just telling you, you when you freeze the economy, you close it down, lock it down, economic activity stops. And when you um, do the opposite, it restarts. And the, the, we, we've had a go at trying to figure out how much, you know, how, what's the best you could hope for basically. So if you take where we're starting from in terms of the initial hit to GDP, you say the government is opening up um, sectors gradually, and then you, you project forward what that looks like based on countries that have opened up already. What you see is big chunks of the economy, about a third of the economy, the, the sort of social interaction parts of the economy, they'll be at, you know, something like 10% closed for the rest of this year. And that mm -hmm. is just a huge recession. So without trying to pile on the gloom too much, um, the V is not telling you anything. You'll get a V, but there'll still be large chunks of the economy that, that are closed. Just, just quickly on the, 
uh, labor market impact. So, you know, what, what's really odd about this is the, the, all the schemes that have been put in place, the furlough schemes, unemployment scheme, they're basically stopping, um, they're freezing the economy and they're stopping the, in a way, realizing the impact of the hit to the economy in terms of unemployment. So for April, we barely saw the unemployment rate budge at all. And, you know, you definitely don't want to take too much optimism for that because there's a there's a big load of policy that's that's stopping people pouring into into unemployment that's that's the way to to think about what's happening at the moment but two groups really um stand out in terms of who's hit hardest so the first is is those on lower incomes and that's mainly because um uh people who are paid less are more likely to work in sectors like retail, hospitality, and therefore you get a bigger, a bigger hit to, to, to those groups in terms of the, the pay, they're more likely to lose their jobs and more likely to be furloughed. And the other group is the young, and the young are, are, are really, uh, it's really tough. So uh, I think we see something like 30% of 18 to 24s move um, onto the furlough scheme, one in 10, um, saying they're losing their, they've been made redundant. So this is um, RF surveying work that we've we've done on this. Um, so it's you know there's a big impact there, and we know that this early career experience has a real scarring on you. So um, you know the combination of all these things, and we'll we'll obviously come on to that, is has got to be first order for policymakers, and they really need to respond to this if we're going to stave off a big rise in unemployment, a big rise that hurts those groups um, a heck of a lot. And James, can I, can, can, sorry, can I ask you a question? This is, this is going to be one of those moments where you're going to see where this is coming from. A middle-aged man asks, of course the politics around support for young people coming into the economy is politically a no-brainer. Right? The economic impact, I imagine, of middle-aged women and men losing their jobs right, and the impact they have on households and then within the economy on, you know, payment for mortgages, mortgage defaults, etc., is, is presumably quite profound. And you would have thought when you look at the scale of mass redundancies that we're seeing is going to be increasingly common. So... When you look from a, from a Resolution Foundation point of view, I, I can totally understand how you can look at the hospitality sector and say, we need to think about younger people. But what do you think about the impact on middle-aged people, people in the middle or second half of their working lives, who are very likely to lose their jobs in this recession, and how you support them and what the, what the economic impact is, not to mention the impact on them and their families? So, so for me, the biggest thing is the size of the unemployment here is still up for grabs here. So, um, you know, it, what, what you've got is a bunch of firms who are looking at what's happening now. They can borrow cheaply from the government. They can put their uh, workers on furlough, but they're looking to the future and they're thinking, well, what's this going to be like? What's the long term impact of all this? Nobody obviously knows the answer to this. But if you do more now in terms of policy and you push a more rapid recovery, then um, then you know firms are going to be much more reluctant to part with their staff because mm -hmm. you know their staff have experience and you know to your point about um, you know the age range the the thing that differentiates the young is that they you know tend to have less time in jobs than older workers so they have less sort of job specific skills and that kind of thing it, it tends to be a case of uh last in first out in, right. terms of, in terms of businesses so so for me that's that's the biggest policy thing to try and minimize that hit and help those uh worst affected sectors right okay J james i'm gonna i'm gonna slightly spoil your fun and linda's and stephen's too because before giving you the chance to, if you like, Mark Rishi Sunak's homework. I'm actually going to ask a bunch of people who's, who, who've made you know, points along the way as you've been speaking. Um, and I'd love to bring in, I see, so Uma Hassan was, uh, had, a, had a point of view on this, Rachel uh, Bentley. I see uh, B, I don't know how to pronounce your surname, but Boilia or Boilia, Boilo, I don't know. But, and, and talk to Chris Cook, I need to come to, because I want to hear what he thinks. And likewise, Jack Kessler, who's a refugee from the Treasury. So we need to find out what they will say. So, Umar, can I ask, start with you? Because it seemed to me as though you were not entirely persuaded. Hello. You, you weren't entirely persuaded by the, 
meal deal and the short term or the the, the targeted VAT cuts. What, what did you think of Rishi Sunak's statement yesterday? To be honest, I think, James, in terms of the statement, I think because the UK is a service services based economy, um, the meal deal is is welcome. I think it's a good first step. But the but one of the big issues here is if you're going to enforce a meal deal into it, who's it going to benefit? If it's going to benefit the likes of Pratt and Itsu, which are very well known in London, then a lot of the office workers are going to be at home. They're not going to pop into Pratt or Itsu. So it means that the companies who have sort of been working from home need to bring their employees back into the office. Otherwise, um, I think with the meal deal, it, it pretty much got to be over before it even gets off the ground. Could, could I ask you a question? Well, because so, so I, I'm going to make a confession. This is this is guilt on my part. Not quite 10 years ago, probably around that, maybe nine years, I'm going to get the, the budget wrong. The Chancellor brought in a proposal to tax certain hot meals, right? And this became known, you're too young to remember it, as the pasty tax, right? And for about a week after the um, budget, the nation debated the rights and wrongs of taxing pasties, right? Cornish pasties, our treasured Cornish pasties, right? And of course, we were living in a post-financial crisis world where, frankly, pasties were neither here nor there. And I just wondered whether or not when you looked at the statement yesterday and an autumn deal to go for a meal, whether you think, you know, this is just politics and it's flim flam or, or whether you think it's actually going to make a meaningful dent on the economic problem we've got. I may be leading the witness there, but I, I want to know what you think. I think with the pasty tax, by the way, I've not had a pasty in years, so you can you can judge not me on that. Tax, not for tax reasons, Umar, I, I, I would like to say. <laughs> not, for, not for tax reasons, but I think I think the problem here, because um, I think when you're cutting VAT from 20% to um, 5%, it's about 15% drop. So a meal, a usual meal deal is about £3 right. for most places. So if you cut that down to 5%, then it's probably about £1.50, two, £2.50. So it's yeah. sort of, it's not a big difference in terms of price, but right. it's, but I think what you have to consider here is it's nothing like the pasty tax. And if we can think that we're going to spend our way out of it by eating loads of pasties or sandwiches, <laughs> it's, 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 kind of like, it's a bit of a lone fallacy because if we're trying to fight COVID by getting ourselves fit, surely what we're thinking is we should be eating our way out of it rather than <laughs> getting fit out of it. So it kind of has, it's sort of like a double-edged sword, so to speak, James. I, I, I suspect that you and I could talk a good deal about about this and also probably not necessarily uh, get far. And I'm going to try and bring in a number of other people. Umar, thanks so much. Um, B, are you there? Yep, yep, I'm there. How do I pronounce your surname? Um, Boiler. Boiler? I, yeah. There you are. Easier than you think. So, so B, what do you think? Well, about um, the meal deal thing, I mean, I... No, not just the meal deal, but sort of the Rishi Sunak statement, or broadly, what's, your, what's on the top of mind? Well, in general, I, I got whiplash from it, honestly. You know, the feeling that we're being encouraged, as Lindsay was saying on the chat, I think, to go out and spend more. But... Mm. There's no progress, been, you know, we don't have an effective test and trace system. We're going to, we're being encouraged to go and sit in restaurants when it seems likely that that's going to cause an accelerated spread again and no clarity on what happens if that happens. You know, there's no clear plan mm. in place for that. All the photos of Rishi Sunak in, I don't, I don't know where he was actually, in a restaurant. He wasn't wearing a mask. I can't. Mm. Yes, I can't understand why none of the politicians promoting these plans wear masks yeah. in their photos. It seems like such an easy win, you know, yeah. for a massively health improving thing. But yeah, um, thank you, thank you. That is, is such a good point. I'm going to come to um, Chris Cook, if I might, because partly, partly also because Chris has done a piece of work for us at Tortoise. Chris is one of the editors here. And has been tracked. Well, well, Chris, tell tell everyone a little bit about the Corona Shocker data we've been tracking and what it tells us. Sure. So, so the um, 
we've got through a charity called SIB, which is a regeneration charity. We've got data on um, effectively outgoings from bank accounts um, held by consumers at UK, a group of UK high street banks. And it's a very big, broad data set. So um, in normal times, it would account for something like 5% of household spending would be, would be picked up by it. So it's a decent wedge um, of, uh, of cash. And it's about, it's got coverage at least, I can't remember, of at least about 15% of every ward, right? So we've got 15% of the people in every ward. Um, the, um, the thing that we can see, we saw really clearly was obviously when lockdown came in, spending dropped everywhere by about 40%, you know, uniformly for the first few weeks. One of the very unusual things was that there was no, there were no seasons anymore. There were no specialisms in towns every town more or less became the same same thing the shop yeah. lots of people living near them did okay the shops that were further away from people did worse um the thing that's really come through since then though is that um there is this golden rule right which is that places where you have to travel which rely on people traveling to them are still suffering so the there are so on average we think that spending is now only about five percent down on cards and through direct out bank accounts compared to uh, the same week of last year. Um, but um, we think that's because of a huge surge in grocery spending. So people are spending 15, 20, 30% more to put from place to place or in supermarkets and in grocers because they're eating at home. There's, a, there's an offsetting bigger drop in, um, in absolute terms in, in, um, in non-grocery spending. You can see it in London that the Oxford Street is down by about forty something percent. The ward with Oxford Street, oh. in it. but um, the ward with Amazon in it is up by one hundred thirty five percent. Right, so the, the um, you can see all the like we're we're only down five percent now, but there are enormous regional and and sectoral changes that 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 disguises. Yeah. So the thing that really worries me about the Sunak stuff is is first of all, I think the government is, Whitehall is generally bad at place, right? So one of the problems with having a very centralized state is we don't understand in a fundamental sense that there are, that there are, places, right? So if you're in a, it, they are understood, right? So there's a VAT cut for tourist towns and the places that are still suffering the worst, places like Penzance, Wadebridge, you know, Cumbria, Cornwall, because they've no tourists at all. They're sort of 40, 50% down lots of towns there. And what, what I think the government is quite bad at is it's understood that it needs to have a, a strategy for tourism, right? Tourism. Even in places like Cornwall, most people don't work in tourism, right? Tourism is a relatively narrow sector. And there are places, like if you're an accountant in Wadebridge, you are in real trouble. If you're a landlord in Cornwall, you're in real trouble because your supply chain is in trouble. And actually, they, there's not enough thought about support for for places and there's too much thought about how we can d help particular kinds of business and actually i think we're going to need to have a think about whether we can bail out towns in a in a more direct way well particularly chris presumably if the answer in the next phase of this um disease is going to be local even micro lockdowns the idea of not having a regional economic policy but having a regional health policy or highly localized health policy is just you know it's just not sustainable is it exactly and actually the you don't if you are i mean if you if you're the accountant the account in the accountant in wadebridge right they're hoping that people will start going to tourism places because there's a vat cut for some <laughs> tourism related stuff not all some um that they will their their client base if you like will recover and there'll be a sort of indirect support through that through that way right Actually, it's, it's a really, like, it's kind of hoping for ricochets. Like, it's a really f messy way to do it, which is what we, what we really need to do is find ways of getting checks to people in towns that we know are collapsing. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to bring in, if I might, I'd love to bring in Katya Staple, and, um, uh, and actually I'm going to ask Yasmin too, because sort of Yasmin's question is, I suppose, my super question. Um, but Katya, you, you've, you've raised the point, hello there, you, you've raised the point about furloughing and whether sort of furloughing disguises trouble to come. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, that's the thing I worry about because just building on the point that Chris has made, I mean, sort of the, the spikes, like the, the different sectors have reacted very differently. And, you know, some are doing well or better and some are 
some are doing much worse and, and will be doing worse in time to come. So hospitality and all of these things. But with the furlough scheme, we're just sort of keeping it all sort of flying as it was or sort of holding on to the world as it was before and just, just buying time. So my big worry is that yet again, we're just losing time. I mean, there's like the furlough scheme is effectively buying time where you could think of, okay, what does the economy look like in the yeah. future? What is a shock? But what is a structural change to the economy and the way people live? And how do we move people towards these spikes and make sure they work and or position themselves in the sectors that, that work? So I'm just, I'm just worried we're losing time yet again and just sort of the government sticking their head in the sand trying to... Well, uh, well you, I, I expect you're going to be able to track this in that there's a 45-day consultation period that that companies, I think big companies, need to engage in. And so you will be able to see when redundancy statements are made by the big companies and how they relate to the end of furloughing support, i.e. end of July, end of August, end of September. So I think you will be, will be able to track it. I'm going to come back to Stephen on this in a moment. But before I do, Yasmin, do you want to um, weigh in? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting to ask the question around whether people are going to stay in the UK, especially um, since the UK is a country, I mean, London in particular is a country with uh, a city with loads of migrants, um, or, or at least economic migrants. I'm certainly what people would consider an economic migrant, someone who moved to the UK for work opportunities and so on, um, and have less kind of like allegiance to the the concept of the country for the sake of it, right? Um, my parents also moved uh, to where I grew up, Australia, for economic opportunity. And so there's this question of um, why would people stay if um, especially in a world where there's like a lot more remote opportunity. I don't actually, for the work that I do, I don't need to be in London. I don't need to pay London rent. I don't need to pay London food, like grocery prices. So why would I stay? And I wonder like how much that, um, you know, plus Brexit on top of that, uh, how much that'll kind of impact um, the, the ideas or the modeling going forward around on. Uh, it's, it's, so, it's such a fascinating question, not least because you might see the politics of post-COVID conservative government being quite different around immigration if that, if that plays out as you suggest. But, but Stephen, will you do, I suppose, what we asked you here to do in the first place, really, which is give us your view on, on what the Sunak statement has done and also what, it, what it's not done. Um, how do you judge it? Well, I think the Wagamama sort of two for the price of one offer um, is good headlines, but it's pure politics. It's nothing else than pure politics. I think the support for apprenticeships or whatever you want to call them for younger people is, is well made. Um, but the main issue, I think, is this, uh, that the furlough scheme you know, drifts to a close by October. The furlough scheme was introduced to deal with the uncertainties and the difficulties of COVID-19. but you can only really confidently say it should come to an end in October for two reasons. One is that you're certain that COVID-19 will not be coming back, and I don't think anyone is certain about that. Or alternatively, it's because the Chancellor wants to basically say we can't afford to carry on locking down. And this is a sort of very uncomfortable trade-off because most of us have argued up until now that the lockdown is absolutely essential to get the disease mm -hmm. under control. Once they've got it under control, then everything goes back to normal. But if it doesn't go back to normal, if like the Spanish flu 100 years ago, there's a second wave or a third wave, um, then I think in one sense what Rishi Sunak is doing is saying, we can't afford to pay for a similar lockdown for a second or third wave. And that gets you into really difficult moral and political territory, frankly. The other thing I'll just briefly say, it's a slightly um, unrelated point, but there is, of course, tremendous uncertainty about which industries will be in permanent difficulty as a consequence of COVID-19, maybe aviation, for example, and which might sort of rebound quite quickly. I was saying to people earlier on that I'd been to the hairdressers this afternoon, they're really busy. Uh, so hairdressing has come back in a way that perhaps people might not have thought um, a few, few weeks back. But there's a kind of, what I describe as a sort of Thatcherite problem with this. I'm not a Thatcherite at all, but the Thatcherite problem in one sense is to say, we know the world's going to change. Mm. We don't know how it's going to change, and therefore we're going to support everyone. But supporting everyone actually is incredibly expensive, and it also means that everyone queues up and says, but I want support, and I want support, and 
I want support, and the bill gets higher and higher and higher. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you have to sort of accept that there are certain industries that are going to shrink on a permanent basis. Uh, and that's a difficult thing to digest, but I think it is a truism. Uh, yeah. The uncertainty of which industries, that's still very great, but no one's going to be very surprised if in a year or two years' time, the aviation industry has shrunk on a permanent basis. Indeed, some people might say it's a good thing in terms of its impact on climate change. Mm -hmm. but, but Stephen, can I put, can I put to you that, that, that we may be missing something really important here in that Look, there's a lot of excitement around a new chancellor, someone who's obviously a political talent. Right? Whether you agree with what he's done or not, you can see that he's making an impact, certainly within his party. But the actual decisions that he's making when it comes to the scale of intervention and the problems that he's encountering seem to me to be quite small and that quite often his policy has played catch up with his rhetoric. Right. So if you look back at the very beginning, his first budget didn't really deal with coronavirus, then had to play catch up, launches coronavirus business interruption loans scheme. They don't seem to work. It takes about a month to get to the bounce back loans. And, and now we're looking at something where we may be debating restaurants and apprenticeships. But the reality is the fundamental issue is, is this decision to close down the furloughing scheme, the job retention scheme at the end of October. And by, by not tapering it much further into the distance or providing sectoral or localized support in the form of a job retention scheme, there's not a safety net for the economy here. And, and isn't that the fundamental choice that he's made and the one that probably not being properly interrogated? Well, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be surprised if that were to change at some point over the next two or three months. I, I, I think... Really? Well, I, th I think what he's, he's considering currently is a very straightforward idea. It goes back to Andy Haldane's V-shaped recovery. He's hoping that things rebound. He's hoping that people, if you like, regain the confidence to go back to what they were doing previously. He's hoping, possibly wrongly, that COVID-19 is in abeyance and will not come back in a significant way. And he's thinking, well, if all that happens, and perhaps the economy will be stronger, and I can afford to remove some of these things that are currently in place. Right. However, if it turns out that we have a, you know, a, a second wave or whatever it might be, or we have these local lockdowns coming through, maybe you'll have to change tack again. I mean, the, the good news for him in one sense, I think it's important to stress this, that normally when, you, when the government is borrowing very, very heavily, mm. people worry about the impact on the, current, on the currency, the impact on the financial right. markets, on the bond market, all these kinds of things. And to be fair, whether it's the UK or a whole host of other countries around the world, borrowing costs for governments are absolutely at rock bottom. So you can afford to take on more debt than you would have done in the past. You can get away with it. It's not going to do too much near-term damage. Mm. And so I suspect that if push comes to shove, um, then you'll have to do more at a later date. But I accept there is an uncertainty because of the fact that the furlough scheme is dependent on a clock, and yeah. COVID-19 is not on that same clock. Yeah. So Stephen, th thank you. Um, Linda, wh what do you think what do you think he, he should have done? And, and what do you think to this point on scale? Um, I think what this is, is almost a, um, you know how the first season of a TV series is tends to be bang and then it gets renewed and then you look at the sophomore season and you think, mm. and then you hope the finale, the third season is going to be great. Mm -hmm. I sort of see this mini budget as the second season. I think he's essentially, holding tight to see how much the economy rebounds. I think that the measures in here give a taste of what else is to come. So the two things that obviously have grabbed a lot of attention, this meal uh, discount, um, the, the principle behind it is a time limited stimulus. So you need to go and spend it basically in August, and I'm sure everybody already knows this, only between Monday to Wednesday. <laughs> um, but a time limited, um, boost is a way of bringing forward demand. So this, I think, is almost a taster of what else we could expect. Of, if, it, yeah, if it works. In the kind of, sorry. If, if it works, Linda, i.e. They're, they're, they're testing out a voucher scheme for helicopter money, in effect, but in a very targeted way. Um, yes, I think that is. Um, so one thing, yeah, you could um, have done this in a much bigger uh, scale. There's different ways of doing it. Um, so my guess it will be that this is a bit of a 
uh, a test almost to see how people respond to time limited stimulus measures. Right. Um, and I think the overall point is that um, we just don't really know what's going to look like after the third quarter, which is what we were discussing before. Mm -hmm. So I think he's holding his fire on that. And then the second big thing is because the furlough scheme is ending in October, the very targeted um, Kickstarter scheme, the apprenticeship scheme, um, these are essentially intended to keep uh, to basically try and prevent young people from not, um, you know, from falling out of the of the labor force. Mm -hmm. um, and this needs to, and if you look at also the job retention bonus, you have to keep the workers on until January. So what this is doing is basically laying the groundwork to say, um, let's see if this plus the part-time option in the um, current coronavirus job retention scheme um, allows enough employment to kind of get back going again. And if it doesn't work, I also wouldn't be surprised um, if he extends the part-time work scheme within the current furlough scheme, because both Germany and France are doing that. It's called short-time work. And right. I think France has said they would use it, they will extend it for up to two years. So what this did in the financial crisis is to prevent German unemployment from rising because you subsidize employers to keep workers, even if they're only working part-time hours. So mm -hmm. if it turns out that this sort of, uh, this mini budget doesn't quite get consumption uh, going, there's yeah. still problems yeah. with, um, with employers feeling uh, that they can afford to keep people on. And we could end up with a second hit of coronavirus um, sometime in the autumn, the flu season. Then I think you'll see a, a much bigger package, which is geared at essentially the same principles um, that the, this, this package is geared at, which is keep people in work, try to support them with income. Um, one possibility could be universal basic income, helicopter mm -hmm. money, a check, stimulus check, America's done it, Japan's done it, um, but make it time limited so people spend it um, and there's different ways of doing that, including mm -hmm. saying there'll be a tax rise in a year. Um, and then, of course, the kind of the other uh, big part of this is whether or not global demand also rebounds, because when you think about an economy, there's four sources, four engines, really. Exports tend to help, but not in a global pandemic in a reliable way. Um, consumption, and that wholly depends on people being in work, being confident enough to consume. Firms have to feel confident enough to invest, to hire, mm -hmm. to produce. And then there's the government. So mm -hmm. if you look at all four of those sectors, I suspect um, he's looking to see how the first three do before he wheels, he kind of rolls out the big guns in the mm -hmm. autumn statement with the spending review and the integrated review and all of the things that need to kind of come in a big package. So when he announces it, he can talk about medium term debt sustainability as well. OK, OK, well, that's massive. Linda, that's massively helpful. Gives at least a framework for how this year will, will pan out. I, I want to bring in, if I can, Jack Kessler, my colleague, as I said, because uh, he joined us from the Treasury, and I see Mark Haywood's got his hand up, so I'll come to you in a moment, Mark. But, but Jack, I, I wanted to ask you, because, you know, um, uh, I'm a journalist, so I'm, I'm prone to liking great historical analogies and big statements. FDR and the New Deal, if you're a Treasury official or Mandarin or recovering Treasury Mandarin, that's the way I'm going to treat you, Jack. Um, do, you, do you look at things like new, the New Deal and think that's just rhetorical flourish and actually there's no place for a big public works program? Or do you think there is something to that? How do you think the Treasury is thinking about all this? I think there's definitely a place for... Um, my colleague, uh, uh, Polly, had a really good point earlier on in the chat, which is the food voucher scheme, as much as one can make fun of it, have we just nationalized the Pizza, uh, Pizza Express voucher scheme? Um, yeah. But um, is it hitting target voters? And if you look at all the marketing around sort of Rishi Sunak PLC, yeah. um, I think that the Treasury is an immensely political department uh, and um, they will do uh, what they think is right for keeping Red Bull seats. Um, I think there's a lot of personal risk for um, Sunak in two ways. One, for being so openly the face of all the spending leads. The question, the point I made, is, is, is it going to be the Rishi Sunak personal allowance reduction? 
Is he going to put his, his name to that? And the second point I would just want to make is, um, if there is a second wave, um, or maybe just a longer first wave, and it comes because people have been going out to restaurants and they've been told to go out to restaurants by Rishi Sunak and the government, what does that do for him personally? What does that do for the government? And obviously, what does it do for the economic recovery? It's immensely risky everywhere you look. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think it's really interesting. I mean, the politics is interesting too, to have someone who's so early in Boris Johnson's premiership is being, you know, quite deliberately positioned as the prime minister in waiting. There's no, there's no shortage of political risk there too. So it's, it's very interesting. Mark Haywood, I see you've got your hand up. Mark, you there? Yes, hello. Yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Um, I've just been listening to um, Linda using that phrase helicopter money and um, of course we're living through a time when there's been quantitative easing as well going on for years and years and now we've got the Chancellor's furlough scheme uh, which is subsidising firms to keep labour on. Um, it, it's a matter of time before we start to hear more dissenting voices in this big debate starting to murmur the word inflation. Um, mm. If, if it weren't a virus we were fighting, we would certainly have heard that a lot more by now, that based on the, you know, the fairly simple idea that what's going on is there's been a stimulus given to demand, and yet we, we've got a big supply side problem. And that's the big difference, of course, between this problem and what happened in 2008 with the banking crisis. That was a, a collapse of demand, whereas now with people not working and firms closing down and so on, we've, we've got a collapse of production at the same time. Um, I, I just think we're, we're, you don't have to dig very far to already find one or two people are saying, you know, these policies are going to lead to inflation if the Chancellor keeps them up, mm -hmm. remarkably, given that inflation is so uh, exceptionally low and has been for a long time. Um, and my question, therefore, is, uh, is it safe to disregard those voices? Mm. Uh, and if not, should they be marginalised and, and can that be done? Because I think they could become a very severe constraint. Yeah. yeah. What the Council, particularly in this country, is able to do in the, in the forthcoming months. Um, Mark, thank you. Um, uh, James, I'm going to ask, that's a difficult question, so I'm going to bat it direct to James Smith. <laughs> James, what, what do you think, is there an inflation risk that we're underestimating? And, and will you also just pick up on the point that Stephen made about, if not just higher prices, the future for higher taxes? Yeah, I, so, so I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about inflation risk, I have to say, and I, the reason is this. So if inflation does start going up, and I, I don't see any uh, way that could be transmitted in a persistent way to the economy, particularly if there's a really large rise in unemployment. But if there is, we're in an economy that has supply constraints and, you know, we're putting money into bits of it, you might get localised inflation that could become persistent. We know what we're doing with that. We're raising interest rates and we can head that off pretty easily. The, the risk on the other side is the one we can't deal with. It's you are in a uh, you come into this crisis with a very weak growth, um, very poor living standards um, decade, basically. So living standards have stagnated for basically a decade. And this is a crisis we didn't want. We don't have the policy tools to deal with it with interest rates very low. And the risk is this crisis drives us further into that, into that malaise. So you have to you have to um, be active with policy to try and head off head off that risk. So that for me, that's that's the big thing here. And to your question, James, about um, how I think about um, Rishi Sunak's um, measures yesterday. So a lot of it is welcome. He's focused on jobs. He's focused on supporting some of the key bits of the economy. So that is definitely welcome. Um, but for me, the 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 thing that we have to keep in mind is the the changed environment that we're in. So. We've basically come from a financial crisis where central banks were famously the, the only game in town and they were propping up the economy, but they can't do that anymore. Interest rates are rock bottom. Um, they're doing more QE, but that's not going to help all that much because um, you can't push down longer term rates very much either. So fiscal policy is becoming the only game in town. So right. we have to view fiscal policy in a completely different way. So all the attention today in terms of the media has been on meal deals or apprenticeships or some mm. some small mm. aspect of it but the question is is the sum total of what he announced yesterday right for for what um for what we need and i think my answer would be that there has to be a big risk uh 
in announcing a fairly small stimulus of 30 billion sounds like a lot of money um and you know when you, when you put it like that can we afford it but the, the the real truth of this is we can't afford not to put in place large-scale stimulus because the risk is unemployment rises in the long term hits the economy so for, for me that that's the biggest thing here um be more active to think about fiscal policy in its totality rather than in its individual bits you know you can have 10 policies that all are a good idea but if they don't add up uh to enough to stop unemployment rising then it's not enough and for me there's a gamble being taken here with um with the possibility of a rise in unemployment uh, james thank you um in the final three minutes i've got a question for linda and a question for stephen linda how bad is the outlook for the u.s economy uh, it's not good because the second wave that we're discussing hypothetically here has already hit them. So the United States, um, all the indications are um, that they are going to have to go into another period um, of lockdown. And I think the expectation is that's going to have a, a pretty significant um, knock on effect in terms of the economy. But one thing I would stress, given how important we uh, unemployment is, and this is why we've been talking about it, is that the US labor market tends to be, um, it's much more flexible. So in Europe, generally speaking, and this is just generally speaking, when unemployment rises, it tends to stay high for some time. In the United States, unemployment tends to go back to uh, the kind of uh, the long-term you know, rate. So even, and we'll see, I mean, the current jobless claims, as well as the unemployment rate, has been declining um, in the US. There's a bit of lag in these figures. So I expect that it, they'll probably rise again because of the second um, lockdown. But just the speed with which unemployment falls um, as activity picks up, um, this is a feature of the United States, which is also why the longer term potential for the United States is still pretty good. They've got other problems, um, you know, opiate crisis, labor force participation rates dropping. But generally speaking, um, I would say the kind of hysteresis scarring issue tends to be slightly less uh, for the United States. But okay. right now, um, not too good, James, <laughs> in terms of uh, the lockdown. But we can learn lessons because I think what you see in the United States is um, what can happen uh, when you have, um, you know, uh, an another uh, without contact, without contact okay. tracing, yeah. without mask wearing, without social distancing, all of these things are contributing to another wave of lockdown in the US. Right. I, I see that um, Tobin has messaged in from Napa and they're going back to a modified lockdown today. Well, and Stephen, here's my, here's my final question for you. Are the markets right or are they crazy? I imagine 17 years chief economist of the HS, at HSBC, you would go in there and give your predictions and then the markets would go off and do something else entirely. So you're used to this, this problem. But, but, but how do you explain the buoyancy of the markets and the, the very downbeat forecast from economists? Of course, this is with the benefit of hindsight, given what markets has do have done over the last two or three months. Yeah. But I think the answer is kind of simple, that we've had a huge amount of monetary stimulus in particular from central banks. Um, and we found over the course of the last few years, when you do this, it tends to flow into risky financial assets, whether it's equities or corporate bonds or whatever might be the case. And of course, these have been completely bombed out earlier in the year, but right. then rebounded from the end of March um, incredibly strongly. But I think there's something else which is important here, which is that this all relates to listed companies, big companies being bailed out through monetary policy. If you're a small or medium-sized enterprise not on the stock market, you're in a fundamentally different position. And I think a lot of the job losses we're going to see aren't necessarily from the big names that get the newspaper headlines. It's from all sorts of little companies up and down the country, whether it's the US or the UK or Europe. Um, and they're not, gonna, they're not gonna come back. They're gonna go and they're gonna be gone and the jobs will be lost as well. So I think what you have, and this is a sort of a big sort of um, income and wealth inequality story, frankly, uh, that those who've already got financial assets have done pretty well out of this crisis so far. Um, and those who don't have financial assets, who have a job in a restaurant or something, are the ones that are really suffering. So monetary policy, as has been true for many of the last few years, has ended up targeting, in one sense, the wrong part of the economy. Mm -hmm. I think huge problem for the months and quarters ahead. 
Okay, well, we, we must definitely revisit that because if anything, th those people who, who remember covering the financial crisis, the biggest thing that we missed was what the impacts of policy were going to be and who was going to benefit and who didn't. And the last decade has seen the, the, the politics of that economic response play out. So Stephen, thank you. That's a sort of salutary point to end on. Um, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. If you've been to a thinking before, the aim of it is to try to come out with, if you like, a, a, a better informed point of view. I certainly feel as though I have that. Um, I have to say that I come away, if anything, uh, much more worried, much more confirmed by the, 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 the laying on of risks and problems in the economy, um, starting with the demand problem we had, but then moving into the scarring that we talked about through unemployment, the scale of unemployment we talked about, the, the knock-on impacts of unemployment then within the economy that, that Linda talked about and the specific ways they hit certain people and, as Chris said, certain, certain places, all, all of that makes me think, uh, and sorry to be so blunt about it, that what we saw yesterday was a very political answer to a very big economic problem. And I think we might come back and look at the serving up of two meals in a restaurant as something that seemed gimmicky when the, the problems that were about to visit us in the third and fourth quarters were, were much more serious uh, than that. But maybe I should be a little bit more uh, buoyed up by the fact that this is a process, everything the government has done has been iterative and the big decisions they can and have to make will come in the autumn budget. So the way I'm gonna look at this, if I might, is, is to take away uh, Linda's uh, idea. I think Linda, I came into this conversation thinking we were gonna talk about FDR versus Ronald Reagan, but, but you've suggested to us an entirely different American import, which is what I wrote down was box set economics that we'd lived through the slightly creaky pilot and the first season that was lockdown, we're now for our sins strapped in to one box set after another. This one is season two, and as you say, it's probably not, not, not fully written when they started airing it. Um, and the terrible thing is all of us who've been in lockdown and watched more TV than it's good for us, know that once you get locked into these things, you can never get out of them. And that's probably the state of the UK economy for a fair while yet. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. A huge thank you to, to Stephen, uh, to James and to Linda, but thank you everyone for the torrent of conversation in the chat. I hope it's given everyone a little bit of a handle on what's happening because things do look unclear, but I hope it's cleared up a little bit, certainly has for me. So a huge appreciation to you. We can't applaud you, we can do only this, which is give you a happy wave goodbye and wish you all a very good evening. Thanks everyone for your time.